very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. I'm Smriti Rastogi with breakfast news and a quick look at the top headlines of the day. States set for final phases of voting in UP and Manipur. 40 seats in UP and 22 in Manipur to vote on Wednesday. Indian Ocean Rim Association Summit begins in Jakarta. Ahead of summit, Vice President Mohammad Hamid Ansari says, Piracy, terrorism, major issues of concern. Former Pakistan NSA statement on 26-11, a reaffirmation of ITS stance, says India. Mahmood Ali Durrani says, attack a classic example of cross-border terrorism. US President Donald Trump signs new executive order on travel ban, removes Iraq from list, new measures to affect six mainly Muslim nations. And India take crucial 142 run lead in second innings against Australia in the second test in Bengaluru. They have six wickets in hand. The 21 nation Indian Ocean Rim Association Summit began in the Indonesian capital Jakarta today. Vice President Mohammed Hamid Ansari is attending the summit. The theme of the summit is strengthening maritime cooperation for a peaceful, stable and prosperous Indian Ocean. The leaders will lay emphasis on connectivity, open maritime trade and rights of navigation at the meet. At the meeting, the member nations are expected to also adopt an IORA Concord and an action plan. The IORA Concord is a strategic document containing the vision and norms of the future of the cooperation among the member countries. Ahead of the summit, Vice President Mohammed Ahmed Ansari termed piracy and terrorism major issues of concern. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, maritime safety and security, it's a maritime uh, focused uh, gathering. And the most important thing is that uh, for rib countries to be able to cooperate with each other, they need safety and security. As you know, we've had... Uh, in the western part of the Indian Ocean, uh, literal serious problems of piracy and uh, terrorism. For the moment, it has been contained as far as the uh, Northern Arabian Sea region is concerned, thanks to very good uh, international cooperation. But these are things which you have to guard against uh, because terrorism is an international phenomenon and it surfaces in different parts of the world. And now all the election news and verdict 2017. The stage is set for the seventh and final phase of polling in Uttar Pradesh on 8th of March. The high voltage campaigning drew to a close on Monday evening. 40 seats spread across seven districts, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Lok Sabha constituency, Varanasi, will vote in this phase. The other districts include Jaunpur, Ghazipur, Mirzapur, Chandoli, Sonbhadra and Bhadoi. Voting in the three Naxal affected districts of Sonbhadra, Mirzapur and Chandoli will take place between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. tomorrow, while in the rest of the places, the polls wrap up at 5 p.m. 535 candidates, including 51 women, are in the fray in this phase. 1.41 crore people are eligible to vote. The BSP is contesting on 40 seats, while BJP on 32, SP on 31, Congress on 9 and RLD on 21 seats. Boatmen, farmers and fishermen who live along the Ganga in Varanasi find themselves a lot delusioned. With every candidate paying lip service to their needs, Varanasi's boatmen and fishermen have floated their own political party called Nishad that is contesting its first election this year. Banaras is incomplete without its boatmen and fishermen. Not just their social role, but their political contribution is no less significant. In 2014, both groups rallied strongly behind the BJP, but this time they are pinning their hopes on a new outfit, the Nirbal India Shoshit Hamara Amdal or Nishad party. <laughs> तो जो भी कोई काम पड़ता है हम लोग इकट्ठा होके अपना निषाद पार्टी की तरफ से 
हम लोग अपने मांग को पूरा किया जाता है ये हमारे निषाद पार्टी खड़ा है हम उनको सपोर्ट करेंगे या हारे या जीते Ironically the community's fear displacement from a pet development project of the center the boatmen fear loss of livelihood by a proposed jetty in the Kashi Banega Kyoto plan The jetty envisaged in Prime Minister Modi's project runs 500 meters long across the Shivala the Shashwamedh and the Rajendra Prasad Ghats and 100 meters into the river जीटी से हम लोग को बहुत ज़्यादा नुकसान है जीटी अगर लग जाएगी वहाँ तो नाव उस पार बनेगी नाव बनेगी तो जो है कि कस्टमर जो इसी पार रहेंगे जीटी पर से ही आरती देखेंगे आरती जब देखेंगे तो हो सकता है आनी तूफान आ जाए यहाँ जो है गर्मी में हमेशा आनी तूफान आता रहता है तो जो जी जो खंड खंड हो जाएगा उसमें बहुत लोग मर सकते हैं The communities want the government to focus only on cleaning ghats and promoting tourism in Varanasi. They claim that tourists come for the ancient heritage and culture of Banaras, and alterations in the original structures will only hurt local residents. Ghat ki sar safai mein yahan ki bevastha honi chahiye, jo ki continuous chalni chahiye isko. Nahi to aise hi matlab jaise aaj istiti hai sar safai ke wajah se to ye istiti hai. Nahi pehle safai nahi hoti thi yahan koi nahi aata tha. Aaj sar safai hone ke wajah se yahan sabki roji rozgar badha hua hai. मॉडर्नाइजेशन की कोई यहाँ जरूरत नहीं है जो नेचुरल चीज है इसको ऐसे ही रहने दी जाए बोटमैन एंड फिशरमैन बिलोंग टू द बैकवर्ड कम्युनिटीज दे कम्प्राइज 16 परसेंट ऑफ द स्टेट्स पॉपुलेशन एंड आर स्प्रेड अक्रॉस 75 फाइव कंस्टिट्यूएंसीज अलॉन्ग द रूट ऑफ द गंगा एंड फोर्टी फाइव सीट अलॉन्ग दमुना इन द स्टेट The discourse among these backward communities is centered around the belief that their backwardness is due to underrepresentation in politics. After consolidating under their own party, they feel that they can wobble the boats of bigger political parties on March 11th. Reporting from Varanasi, with camera person Arvind, I'm Kriti Mishra for Rajya Sabha Television. And Manipur will vote for the second and final phase on 8th of March. A total of 22 constituencies will witness polling. most of which are in the hilly areas 98 candidates are contesting in this phase and most prominently iram sharmila will take on chief minister ibobi singh in his bastion thobal here is why this phase is crucial for the ruling congress six districts chandel imphal east senapati tamenglong thobal and ukrul will go to polls in the second phase All eyes will be on Thobal, where the Chief Minister Okrami Bobi Singh, for the first time since 2002, will face a prominent candidate against him, Iron Lady of Manipur and Praja Party convener Irom Sharmila. But if Bobi's personal battle aside, the Congress will have its attention on the tribal vote as well. The hill districts, especially the Nagas, account for 12 to 15 seats in this phase. So the Congress Party is that they could not capitalize on that earlier score they were having over any opponent when the new districts were created. So altogether the issues have been diverted. It has gone beyond creation of districts. Now people are looking much beyond the districts. Okay, now districts are created. What next? The Nagas have been united in their stand against the formation of the new districts in the state, supported by the United Naga Council and the NSC and IM. The Naga People's Front or the NPF has emerged stronger in the past few weeks but a split in the vote could benefit the BJP. Issue of the economic blockade and the issue of the NSN IM and uh, this agreement signed with the government of India this is a new factor that has entered into tribal politics and I think uh, this is going to polarize the two major tribal groups the kukis and the nagas one big uh, large naga group uh, have been identified with this nsn im so as such uh, i think that uh, uh, this uh, uh, nsn im supported groups are going to have a tougher time this year kukis also form another major force in this phase as they influence almost 5 to 6 seats Many senior leaders from the community left the Congress for the BJP, but their anti-Naga stance could help the Congress. In the Naga areas, there is an uh, anti-Congress feeling. See that? That is there. So therefore, and then the fact that uh, there is an anti-incumbency factor uh, among the Nagas and the Kukis uh, who have won last year's elections, and so this uh, anti-incumbency plus anti-Congress. these things are going to work 
campaigning came to an end at 3 p.m. and now hopes are that voters turn out in full force to make the tribal vote count. Akhilesh Suman's report for Rajya Sabha TV. And after a large turnout in the first phase of elections in Manipur, Governor Najma Heptullah has requested people to come out in much bigger number for the second phase. In an exclusive interview to our correspondent Akhilesh Suman, Governor Najma Heptullah discusses political awareness of the people and gives her view on the economic blockage. And the High Court of Manipur has declared the over four-month-long economic blockade in the state as illegal. The blockade has been called by the United Naga Council against the government's decision to carve out seven new districts. The High Court has also directed the authorities to deal with those supporting the blockade according to the law. The order was passed on a public interest litigation on 3rd of March. The blockage called by the United Naga Council on 1st of November last year has become a key issue in Manipur where assembly elections are going on. Two key national highways have been blocked by UNC cadres, severely affecting normal life. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has refused to stay the arrest of Uttar Pradesh Minister Gayatri Prajapati in cases relating to alleged gang rape and attempt to rape. Prajapati, then State Transport Minister, has been evading arrest since 27th of February after the Supreme Court directed the state police to lodge an FIR against him. It ordered Prajapati to approach the appropriate court for relief. A bench headed by Justice A.K. Sikri also expressed unhappiness that its order on lodging an FIR against the Prajapati was given political colour. However, in the first major headway in the case, the police has arrested Prajapati's close aide, his gunner, Chandrapal Singh. Singh is being interrogated and the police is trying to extract information about Prajapati's whereabouts and also about the rest of minister's accomplices. Raids are also being conducted at places named by the gunner. Chandrapal will be produced in the court today. And with that, it's time for a very short break. On the other side, more news and updates. Stay tuned. From quarries to metal pieces. Indian currency has seen many changes. The earliest punch-marked coins came from Gandhar. The East India Company at the turn of the 19th century also minted its own coins. The Indo-Greek coins come from a colony left behind by Alexander. They depict the golden rule of the Guptas with embossed human portraits and matrimonial alliances like Chandragupta Maurya's wedding with Seleucus I Niketa's daughter. It's election time again. Voters in five states gear up to cast their votes. Catch all the action in Verdict 2017, Monday to Friday, on Rajya Sabha Television. The prolific British poet and story writer Joseph Rudyard Kipling, one of the first masters of short stories in English. In 1894 appeared his Jungle Book, which became a children's classic all over the world. Kim, the story of Kimball O'Hara and his adventures in the Himalayas, is perhaps his most felicitous work published. Set in and concerned with India, he had come to know and love so well. In 1907, Kipling became the first English language writer to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. Welcome back. The centre has asked SBI to reconsider its decision to levy penalty on non-maintenance of minimum balance. 
The main lender plans to hike the penalty from 1st April and the move is expected to impact over 31 crore account holders with the bank. PTI is also quoting sources as saying that the SBI has been asked to also reconsider its decision to propose levy on cash transactions and ATM withdrawals over specified limits. SBI has announced imposing penalty ranging from 20 to 100 rupees on non-maintenance of minimum average balance in saving bank account from 1st April. The penalty is as high as 500 rupees in case of current accounts. This penalty is being reintroduced after a gap of five years. The government has also urged other lenders, including private sector banks, to reconsider the charges on cash transactions and ATM withdrawals above a certain limit. The Supreme Court has sought response from the Centre and the RBI on a plea alleging that people were not being allowed to deposit demonetized currency note till 31st of March as promised. A bench headed by Chief Justice J.S. Khehar has fixed the matter for hearing on 10th of March. Finance Ministry and RBI have been directed to file response by next date of hearing. The plea referred to the speech of Prime Minister Narendra Modi on November 8, 2016, when he said that citizens would be allowed to deposit the demonetized notes of 100 rupees and 1000 rupees beyond the cut-off date of 31st December 2016 till 31st March 2017. Subsequently, a notification was issued by RBI regarding the same. The bench also noted that the RBI's last ordinance, which permits only those persons who were outside India during the stipulated period to deposit the demonetized currency note till 31st of March is a breach of assurances given by Prime Minister and the RBI. The Reserve Bank of India has said that the impact of note ban on GDP may be seen in the current quarter on some segments. RBI Deputy Governor Viral V. Achare said that the remonetization exercise should be completed in two to three months. The RBI conceded that the temporary impact on some parts of the economy is hard but said it expects the effect to be temporary. He also said the impact of the note ban would help in bringing informal sector into the mainstream economy. Meanwhile, the Union Cabinet has cleared a proposal to revive 50 unserved and underserved airports and airstrips. The estimated cost of this proposal is 4,500 crore rupees and the government hopes to enhance air connectivity to small cities and towns. The proposal was approved by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, chaired by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday. The plan is to revive 15 airports or airstrips during 2017 and 18. 20 would be revived during 2019 and 20. The centre, however, made it clear that the revival plan would be demand-driven. The cabinet also gave its nod for an MOU between India and UN Women that will support governance institutions from the grassroots level to work towards gender equality. The MOU seeks to provide support to the Ministry of Panchayati Raj in strengthening capacities of governance institutions. It will also support in providing support to Panchayati Raj institutions to maintain gender equality in their programs. The MOU covers six states of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Odisha, Karnataka, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. On Monday, Pakistan's former national security advisor exposed the role of Pakistan in 26-11 Mumbai terror attacks. Speaking at the 19th Asian Security Conference in New Delhi, Major General Mahmood Ali Durrani said that Mumbai terror attacks were carried out by the terror group based in Pakistan. He also added that Pakistan had proposed to send a probe team to India immediately after the Mumbai attacks, but the then UPA government did not respond. Durrani said that 2611 terror strikes were a classic example of the cross-border terrorism carried out by a Pakistan-based terror group, but maintained that the Pakistani government had no role in the attacks. Responding to Durrani's comment, Minister of State for Home Affairs Kiran Rijiju said that there is nothing new in it India has held Pakistani government establishments responsible for the attack in which 166 people lost their lives. The terrorist attack in Mumbai carried out by a terrorist group based in Pakistan 
on 26 November 2008 is a classic trans-border terrorist event. I hate to admit this, but this is true. India's position is very well known. There's nothing new revelation for us. Afghanistan and India have been victims of this proxy war for decades now. This is why its framing of CCIT, India has included within its ambit action against entities that fund terror groups, propagate terrorist ideologies, and provide safe haven to terrorists. There are more international developments. An air ambulance of the Medanta Hospital crash landed near Bangkok after it caught fire, resulting in the death of its pilot and injuries to four crew members. Calling the incident unfortunate, Medanta Hospital Chairman and the Managing Director Naresh Trehan said, the air ambulance had gone to Bangkok to bring a patient suffering from lung problem. External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj tweeted, saying the injured have been shifted to Bangkok Hospital by Army helicopters. The plane had taken off for Bangkok yesterday from New Delhi. In the afternoon, it stopped midway in Kolkata to refuel and later crash landed at Nakhon Pathom Airport. The plane was carrying two doctors and a nurse apart from the pilot. A 22-year-old Indian fisherman has been shot dead allegedly by the Sri Lankan Navy. The incident occurred while he was fishing in a mechanized boat at a short distance off Kachathivu Islet. The incident occurred last evening when Briggo from Central Rameshwaram was fishing near the islet along with others and the Sri Lankan naval personnel arrived at the spot and opened fire. Briggo was shot in the neck and died on the spot. Another fisherman suffered leg injuries. The Fishermen's Association in Rameshwaram says that the Lankan Navy did not even fire a warning shot. Tension prevailed in the area as fishermen gathered in front of the hospital where the body is kept and protested against the firing. Meanwhile, the US President Donald Trump has signed a new executive order placing a 90-day ban on people from six mainly Muslim nations. The new measure will block citizens of Syria, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan and Yemen from obtaining visas for at least 90 days. The order also suspends admission of refugees into the U.S. for 120 days. The directive takes effect from 16th of March. Iraq, which was covered in the previous order, has been removed from this new order. The original 27th January order was blocked by a federal court and had sparked confusion at airports and mass protests. The new order removes out language in the original one that indefinitely banned Syrian refugees and called for prioritizing admission of refugees who are religious minorities in their home countries. The new order was unveiled by Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, Attorney General Jeff Sessions and Department of Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly on Monday. It is the President's solemn duty to protect the American people. And with this order, President Trump is exercising his rightful authority to keep our people safe. As threats to our security continue to evolve and change, Common sense dictates that we continually reevaluate and reassess the systems we rely upon to protect our country. We stand by the first executive order. We felt that it was completely compliant with, with the law. Um, but if your goal is to get something done um, in the quickest amount of time, then you have to take into consideration all of those things. Uh, we, we didn't want to wait potentially a year to have it litigated through the court process. The new executive order eliminates certain individuals, lawful permanent residents, Iraqis who were part of the first order, but it does not eliminate the central constitutional problem. In our view, the first order was based on religious discrimination, and this order is as well, so we will continue to challenge it. Meanwhile, in order to deter people from illegally entering the U.S. by crossing the Mexico border, there is a new proposal under consideration by the U.S. Department of the Homeland Security. According to the move, women and children crossing together illegally into the United States would be separated by authorities. Currently, there is a catch and release policy in which migrants who cross illegally are free to live in the United States while awaiting legal proceedings. However, President Donald Trump has called for ending the system. The new scheme would allow the government to keep parents in custody 
while they contest deportation or wait for asylum hearings, while their children would be put into protective custody with the Department of Health and Human Services. Tens of thousands of parents and children, many who are fleeing of violence in Honduras and El Salvador, have been detained coming across the border. The U.S. on Monday issued a travel warning for its citizens visiting Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh and said extremist elements are also active in India. The State Department in its worldwide caution said that the U.S. government assesses terrorist groups in South Asia may be planning attacks in the region, possibly against U.S. facilities, citizens and interests. It says U.S. citizens should avoid travel to Afghanistan as no region in the country is immune from violence. It also said that a number of established terrorist organizations, indigenous sectarian groups and other militants pose a danger to U.S. citizens in Pakistan. It further added that extremist elements are also active in India as outlined in our recent emergency message. Terrorists have hit a wide variety of targets and institutions in Bangladesh. And former BCCI President Anurag Thakur, who is facing contempt notice for filing a false affidavit in the Supreme Court on Monday, tendered unconditional and unqualified apology before it. Anurag Thakur said he had never intended to file any false information before the Apex Court and filed an affidavit explaining the circumstances under, he, under which he made those claims. On 2nd January, the Supreme Court had stripped one of the most powerful men in world cricket of all his powers. The bench fixed the matter for hearing on 17th of April and also exempted Thakur from personal appearance on that day. The Apex Court had on 2nd of January removed Thak Anurag Thakur and Ajay Shirke as the President and Secretary for obstructing and impeding its directions for overhauling governance in the cricket body. The bench had slapped Thakur with contempt and perjury notices for filing a false affidavit over writing to the ICC on the issue of autonomy. And on to some cricket news now. It is the fourth day of the second test match between India and Australia being played in Bengaluru. India have registered a 151 run lead after resuming their overnight score of 213 for 4. Cheteshwar Pujara and Ajinkya Rahane are out. India lost another wicket in KK Nair today. Opener KL Rahul gave India a solid start in second innings with his second 50 of the match. However, the hosts once again seem to be in trouble with Josh Hazelwood's three wickets reducing India to 120 for four. Pujara then steadied the innings along with Rahane with a well-composed half-century. Earlier, the host wrapped up the Australian innings on 276 with spinner Ravindra Jadeja picking up six wickets. So yesterday. And that's all we have for you in this edition of Breakfast News. See you again tomorrow, same time. Then keep watching Rajya Sabha TV.